option. So Amen. welcome, welcome to Thank me. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> I am so happy to be here with all of you. Let's start with a prayer, obviously. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of thy love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Sweet Jesus, we thank you for gathering us here today. And I firmly believe that you have personally called each person here, including me, to speak directly to our hearts. We consecrate the next 24 hours to you, and we ask you, Lord, to place your hand on each of our heads, on each of our hearts, and to pour out the graces that you have for our individual lives. And we ask Our Lady, who was closest to you on earth, and St. Joseph, St. Agatha today, and all of the angels and all of the saints to be with us in this room, in our rooms at night, in the chapel, while we eat, and to pray and intercede for whatever it is that each of our hearts individually needs. And we ask this all in your holy name, sweet Jesus, to the Father in heaven. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm overwhelmed <laughs> because I feel like every time I sat down to pray about this retreat, I felt like clobbered by the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of the way I feel in my life. Like, God just gives me too much, and I can't, like, catch it all and keep up and organize it. So um, I'm excited to see exactly what he gives me for you. Um, I prayed about you know each of the talks and I wrote down notes and things, but he changes things at the drop of a hat sometimes. And so, um, and it's just as much for me as it is for you. But I thought just before I get into this first talk, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about myself because some of you might not know me and I forgot to put that in my notes, <laughs> you know, to introduce myself. But I grew up in Elkhart and I have 12 siblings, and my parents also took in foster kids. When we were little, we adopted my littlest brother then from the foster system. And I have about 100, well, it's like 780 nieces and nephews, so it's not as big as the Titmans, but we're big. <laughs> and I know, you're bigger, we counted once. <laughs> but, um, but we're a big family and 100% Polish. Um, and I went to Notre Dame. And I knew that I was called to be a missionary, and the first time that I did mission work, well, I would consider the first time I did mission work was actually with Vicki. We worked with abused kids when I was 15, and it was on my heart to help them, and I volunteered, and then she got me on the payroll, and I, I worked there for five years. But um, the first foreign mission I went to was in Russia when I was in high school. And then I went to Notre Dame, and when I graduated, I went to live with hermits in South Texas. And um, I fell in love with that life. Um, but long story short, I ended up reconnecting with the people I had gone to Russia with when I was in high school, and I went and founded a mission in Eastern Siberia. So I lived in Russia for two years. And then I went back every year for a, on a month visa, because visas were difficult, for about seven or eight years. So one of my books over there is all about the Russian mission and Our Lady's message to pray for the conversion of Russia and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. It's really powerful. Um, and then I went and I lived like the next 10 years um, between missions all over the world and as a hermit. And I would withdraw for months at a time to different places, but then I would go and I worked in orphanages in Tanzania and in South Africa. I spent months in Nigeria until it got really dangerous. Um, I learned lots of languages along the way. I learned my Polish. We never learned it growing up. I learned Russian um, and some of the other languages I would pick up when I was there and then I kind of forget them when I leave. Um, and then in 2011, I felt really called to go deep back into prayer. So I made vows in this diocese for three years, temporary vows as a hermit. And 
those were the glory years of my life. <laughs> I absolutely love that life, and it is definitely, I think, where I will end up again someday. Um, and then I lived a few more years without vows that way, and then really the well ran dry, and I didn't have the support that I needed. And so I thought, I've got to get a job. I've got to support myself. And the Lord writes straight with crooked lines. And I had a friend that um, he had been a hermit, and then he got incarnated into a diocese, and he works in vocations. And he said, Mary, why can't you just be a hermit and um, take care of children, right? It's very contemplative. And so I became a nanny for triplets at night. So I would just pray. I worked 80 hours a week. Um, downtown Chicago, it was very different because I went from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich. And um, I loved it. And so I've continued since then to work as a nanny, but then the Lord really opened up a ministry, my mission heart, back into the world. And I had a couple books I had written that I found a publisher that wanted to publish, and then he asked me to continue to write. So I've written, I've published six books in the last like two years. Um, there's a few there in Spanish and in Polish, so be careful if you are trying to take one that you take the right language. Um, and then a, a, my publisher said, Mary, run through the open doors. So um, a path got made into the Middle East. And I do a lot of work underground with, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, in northern Nigeria. Um, and my people are killed over there. But we, I've, last year, I think we published 20,000 books for the persecuted Christians. And it's not just books. They go and they do workshops and they teach and they give retreats. And it's really renewing the Middle East. I mean, it's kind of incredible. Um, and then I also have art. So for years I've done icons. And so I've opened an artist shop, which you can find it online. I have it written over there. Um, but I brought some of them framed if people are interested. Um, and I have like a music CD. I, I've done, you know, music a little bit and then my weekly radio podcast program. So I'm, I'm out there more. And then I do a daily rosary on Facebook, which for a long time had about 70,000 people a day. Facebook has completely clobbered me. Instagram has like thrown me off. <laughs> God forbid we pray for humility, right? <laughs> because that's all I'm praying for. <laughs> and they're really kind of rough, but you can still find me if you search it out. Um, and there's probably five to 10,000 people a day that pray with me. So that's, it's just interesting. I still live a very hermit life um, when I'm not working. I'm alone in silence and solitude, no TV, no way to listen to music. Like I'm, I'm very withdrawn. Um, and that's where my heart is, hours and hours and hours of prayer. So that's kind of the source of what these books have all come from. The book that we are, I should have brought it over here, but Out of the Darkness, the book that this retreat is on, it's my dad's favorite. It was written in Eastern Siberia. And so the second year that I was there, the bishop wanted, I was there with a sister and we were waiting for a priest to be sent for a long time. So we were working with the Polish Claritians and eventually a priest was sent and the bishop said, we, I want you in this new mission immediately. Well, sister had to stay in Krasnoyarsk to kind of shut up our apartment and finish up what we were doing. And I got sent to Kansk, which was the only Catholic mission for a thousand kilometers. Now to put this in perspective, my diocese in Russia was physically bigger than the whole United States. So we would spend like seven hours driving to go to some mission to have Sunday mass. People would get mass every couple months. And it was the victims of concentration camp. Um, it was like the Poles, the Germans, the Ukrainians that were Catholic. We had some Russians, but few. Most of them were the children of those who had been exiled. And so I was in Kansk. The only place the Blessed Sacrament was present for a thousand kilometers. I mean, imagine that. And um, I was alone during Lent. And that is when the Lord gave me the first half of this book, Out of the Darkness, which I really wrote for Russia, and someday I want it translated back and given to Russia. 
but about his interior suffering, right? So it's a really good preparation for Lent. Um, the second half are meditations as if the Lord were speaking to you himself, right? And um, that I wrote, so after I left Russia, I went to Southern Spain <laughs> and there's one desert, it's, it's funny, I got in prayer, go and live for three months as a hermit in the desert in Southern Spain. And I was like, I don't even, I know nothing about Spain. I don't even know if there is a desert in Southern Spain. So I called my spiritual director and he said, Mary, there's one desert in all of Europe and it's in Southern Spain. And I was like, Lord have mercy. So I went. And I found a ruin and I got permission from the people who owned the land. And I set up a tent inside of a ruin and I lived there for three months. And I would walk over a mountain. It was very extreme hermit life. Like when they joke that Mary Klaska lived in a cave, I basically did for a few months. And I would walk over the mountain every day into the city to get two things of water. And one I would use to shower and the other I would drink my coffee because I like coffee. Um, I, and I made up like a little plate with a candle so that I could make my coffee every day. <laughs> and then there was mass. And so I lived there until it, it was kind of a desert and the river divided me from the village. And the rainy season came and the river started to fill because it had been empty. And I was, it was getting to a point I wasn't going to be able to cross it. So that's when I thought, okay, Lord, my time is done. But I wrote that second half, like hand wrote it on loose leaf paper when I was living that kind of an intense life. And you put it together and um, it's a really powerful book. What has been amazing to me about this book is um, as the road has opened up into the Middle East, um, and these persecuted Christians have translated this into um, Urdu, which is the Pakistani language. And then my translator, God bless him, found um, exiles from Afghanistan who translated it into Dari. And a few months ago, we snuck 2,000 copies into the persecuted Christians in Afghanistan. And it's so amazing because... Like Christians are fleeing Afghanistan, but Mary Klaska's spiritual children are sneaking in. So I had all these Pakistanis who said, we want to be missionaries like you. We're going to take your books into Afghanistan. And they said that they were stopped like 10 times by the Taliban, held at gunpoint, books were confiscated, and they just kept praying. And I prayed. I, I suffered so much during that time. I broke my foot. I got COVID. My car got crashed like and I kept thinking it's for Afghanistan it's for Afghanistan and finally they made it and the books have been distributed among the Catholic families in hiding there and they've sent me minimal information but I can't even share what they've sent yet just for safety um, once the missionaries leave then I will be able to share some of those stories because the Taliban don't know where our Catholic families are so um it's incredible because out of the darkness, when you read it in light of people being killed for their faith, it takes, it's almost as if the Lord gave me that book for them. Like, you know, this had nothing to do with me. It had to do with these people, you know, in Nigeria too, um, they've been spread throughout the seminaries in the North and like my seminarians get kidnapped and four of them got held at gunpoint for three days. And they're the ones that had this, that read it. They're distributed in the seminaries there to the degree I can raise funds. Um, but it's really beautiful because um, it brings me to the brink of what it means to be a Christian on a daily basis. And that would be my hope for you because like we live in America and there is persecution and there's more and more persecution as time goes on. But, um, to be in contact with people who literally are killed for their faith, it, it makes you ask that question of yourself over and over again. Do I believe this? Am I willing to stand in the darkness with Jesus Christ on the cross? How much does the faith cost? You know, is it worth to me? Um, I was really excited on Monday, Pope Francis announced a new servant of God from Pakistan. And he was the student of my translator. Akif knows him very well. His name is Akash Bashir. And in 2015, it was at their parish. He was guarding the church and a, suicider bomb, a suicide bomber came 
And there were a thousand people in the church and he said, you will not enter. And he tackled him and he got killed. And he is on his way to canonization. But like, these are my people and these are your people. And this is the body of Christ. And like, this is what it means to be Christian. It's like those early days of, of Christianity. Um, the stories I get from the front lines, I could speak for hours and tell you these stories. And you can see over by my books, I did put a photo album and it's pictures of my book with my Muslim converts. So you'll see the women in their, um, in their outfits. <laughs> What's that? What, a burqa, right? <laughs> their burqas. And um, in Pakistan, you can put some faces to this, um, this work. But that was the kind of the impetus of this second book. And the fallout has been a lot of souls in the United States and in Poland. And we're hoping to get my Spanish down through Central America here soon, if I can find funding, to, to touch us in the West as well, right? Because the message of the cross is for all of us, for every single one of us. I thought of you all at mass this morning. I was late. <laughs> I, I sneak in the back, right? The snow was falling, so I, it took me a while to get there. Um, but the first reading was Solomon, if you went to mass this morning, right? And like God came, he offered all these sacrifices to God and he was so pleased. God was pleased. And he said, what can I give you? How can I bless you? And Solomon asked for wisdom. You know, he didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for power, for popularity. You know, he didn't ask to be three sizes smaller. <laughs> he asked for wisdom. And St. Paul tells us that wisdom is the cross, right? The wisdom of God is, uh, the foolishness of God is, is greater than the wisdom of men, right? God's wisdom is very different than human wisdom right? The way that God works is not always humanly prudent, right? Let's look at even a simple example like Joseph. You know, God woke him up and said, flee to Egypt now. That was not prudent for him to wake up in the middle of the night, you know, take his wife and son and run away to a pagan country. But divine prudence called him to do that, right? So the ways of God are, are beyond human ways. And the cross is what teaches us how to think like God, right? Who would think that God would send his son to the world and he would be the rejected and murdered and, you know, despised by his own people? What does it say in John? That Jesus came to those who were his own and his own people rejected him. But that's the wisdom of the cross. It, it seems foolishness in human ways. So what we're asking for the next 24 hours is wis for wisdom from God, just like Solomon. But it's not going to be facts. It's not going to be, you know, some biblical explanation according to, you know, something factual. What we're asking for is a relationship. We're asking for wisdom. Did you know that in Hebrew, when Solomon asked for wisdom, that word wisdom means a listening heart. That's what Solomon asked for, a listening heart. So a heart that listens to God so that they can know God and receive his love and respond to that love, right? And then we're guided in life, but we're guided through love. Love is our lamp. The cross is our lamp. That's, that's our reason, right? It's, it's something different than this world. And it's not easy. Jesus said, what? Like, you want to be my follower? Pick up your cross and follow me, right? Jesus didn't say it was going to be easy. He left bloody footprints for us to follow on that way of the cross. But he also said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light, you know? Come, come to me. And he makes our, our burdens light when we unite with him. So that's my hope is that through this book, through this retreat, you learn to be able to unite your sufferings deeper with Christ to find joy and peace in your suffering. He might take them. You know, like, 
you get a broken leg, you pray for healing, he heals the leg. But you know what? Three months later, you can fall and break another leg. So that's not what we're asking for. We're asking for a healing that makes us one with Christ so we don't even care if our leg's broken, right? It's just a leg. <laughs> I mean, it's easy for me to say now, but I did have a broken leg, so I can use that example, right? And it was a pain. But, um, you know, what we want is to unite our, our sufferings with Christ. And I'm reminded of, I don't know if you heard about that woman in Italy. She's also, a, I think, a servant of God. She's on the way to beatification. Or maybe she's already beatified. But her name was Chiara Potrabello, I think. But she was like St. Gianna Mola. She gave her life for her child, and she died of cancer. And she was really amazing because... She became, she got married, beautiful, beautiful lady, and um, she became pregnant and her baby, she was told, would never live outside the womb and that, you know, it wasn't right for her to carry the baby this law, full term because it would be so bad for her, but she chose to do it anyway. And she gave birth and the baby was baptized and lived like 40 minutes or something. And it was such a grace, such the presence of God, such a gift to her family. Then she became pregnant again, and they said, don't worry, it was kind of a freak thing, it shouldn't be genetic, and lo and behold, she gets pregnant again, and the first time it was a daughter, the second time it was a son, and everything seemed to be going fine, and then they saw he didn't have legs, he didn't have arms, he, his heart wouldn't work, and they said the same thing, and they said how dangerous to carry this child, and she, it was, they said the chances this would happen, they were totally unrelated. She said, no, this is our gift from God. Same thing. She carried him full term, had him baptized, lived 40 minutes and died. So then, you know, people said, aren't you afraid to get pregnant again? And she said, no, these were just freak things, but they were gifts from God and we want a family. And she became pregnant again, perfectly healthy child, but she ended up with cancer. And they said, you know, if you won't abort the baby, why don't you, you know, we'll induce labor very early, which the baby's life would be at risk, but then we could treat you. And she said, no, I want to give my full life for my child. And she ended up dying and she, her cause for canonization is up. It's, it's really beautiful. As she's in the hospital, she gives birth. They take her off for surgery and she's just about ready to go home and die. They said, there's nothing more. Her husband wheels her into the chapel. And he says, Kiara, I have a question for you. And he's crying and she's crying. And she said, what? And he said, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden light. Is it? And she said, yes, this cross is easy and this burden is light because he's with me in it. And she could die with that much faith and that much joy and peace and love. That's the witness of what it means to be a Christian, right? That's what we're called to do. The other thing that made me think of you at Mass this morning was the gospel, of course. Come away with me to a lonely place and rest a while. What did Christ say to everybody, right? He's saying that to you right now. Come away with me to a lonely place and rest a while. There's a lot of us here, but all of you have come with some kind of solitude in your heart. And I ask you to, I mean, you're talking to people while we eat or whatever, but try to guard that solitude and try to take moments um, away from the crowd where you can really listen to what is it? Why did Jesus say to you this morning in the reading, whether you could go to mass or you couldn't, he was speaking to you and I'm sharing that. Why did Jesus say to you, come away with me to a lonely place and rest a while? And what is it that you need rest from, you know? Um, so those were the two things this morning. See, I haven't even gotten to my notes. <laughs> Here I told Vicki, I didn't know if I could do, uh, I don't have a clock. It's only 24 minutes. I think I'm okay. Okay. I'm awful. At I never time things. I just like talk until I'm done. <laughs> but I meant to bring a watch. I don't think there even is a clock. So, so the beginning of this book um, darkness, stillness, and silence, okay? That's what we're going to embrace. And it's something that our world hates, right? Darkness, stillness, and silence. Think about it. 
like in today's modern world, you go to a city, there's darkness nowhere. I live downtown Elkhart and it's only Elkhart, but like, you know, the neon green lights from the bank come in my window. It's so annoying, <laughs> you know, and I, I haven't actually bought like good curtains to black because I'm like, I'll offer it up tonight. I'll offer it up tonight. But man, you can't get away from that. You know, you've got Walmart open 24 seven. You have lights on everywhere. Where can you find real darkness in the world? People don't like it, right? But it's only when you're in darkness out in the country that you see those beautiful stars. I remember in South Africa, we're in this little village, Kumka or something. I don't remember how to pronounce it. And I was with um, Notre Dame grads were running the orphanage and their family came from Chicago to visit. And they were all excited because they brought like the map of all the stars. And I'm not that organized in mission. Like I just go and look up. But they were so excited because we're in the middle of nowhere. And like you could see all these constellations that you can't see in the United States from down there. And, and you know, we spent hours out at night with their little flashlight and their, you know, map and then looking up and all of this. There are certain gifts that we can only receive from God in darkness, Right? So I'm gonna talk about darkness here in a second, but then um, stillness, something else that the world kind of runs away from. You know, productivity is our God. And you know, people always, when I think about that idea, I think of Russia, right? Communist country, you know, where work was made a God, but it's right here in the United States, you know? And you know, how productive are you? What can you show for your day? And we weren't created to do as much as we were created to be. And I'm going to talk about that. But anything you do, God can do better in the snap of a finger. God, like, he's just, he can. But he can't love for you. He made you free so that you could receive his love and return that love. That's the one thing that God can't, like, love himself for you. Like, Either your love of God exists because your will kind of created that, or it doesn't. But God can't, can't love for you. So that's what's more important. And oftentimes when we stop and we have that stillness, that's when we have that, that meeting with God. And then um, silence, same thing, goodness gracious, there's noise everywhere. I mean, you know, you'd go on a bus or you go in a store or you go in the car and you've got cell phones, you've got radio, you've got TV. I've never owned a TV and um, people think I'm crazy. I am so happy in my cloister. <laughs> Every day when I come home, I'm like, thank you so much, Jesus, for this. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I do podcasts and I have music out there, but I don't know how to access it. I've never listened to one. I don't know how any of those things work. Like, I remember CDs, you know, or tape cassettes, and that's all I, you know, know. Um, but I know that I'm odd in that, and that's my little hermit heart that loves silence. But it's only when we create silence in our lives that we can hear God. So I'm going to talk about each one of those three things in this first talk, right? That darkness, that stillness, and the silence. And I'll tell you the title of the book, Out of the Darkness. When I was in Siberia, I was in that chapel alone with the Blessed Sacrament. And, you know, you, I feel such, felt such a responsibility to pray in adoration all the time because I was like, this is the only place Jesus is present for a thousand kilometers. And I'm not good with math, but I think that's like, what, like 750 miles or something. I mean, it's, it's big. <laughs> and... Um, I prayed for a passage like I always do. And the passage I got was from Sirach and it was in Russian. And it was his judgment is sound who fears the Lord. Out of obscurity, he draws forth a clear plan. But in Russian, they say, out of the darkness, he draws forth a clear plan. And immediately it hit me how it was the cross that was his answer to everything. Even it was the cross that was the light he was giving me in the dark of Russia, right? The cross was going to be my candle 
was going to be, you know, what led me as to what I was supposed to do. And I had a great spiritual director at the time that would always say, you know, anytime I ask him something, well, what Jesus do on the cross? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, he'd always point me back to that. What Jesus do on the cross? What would he say? You know, so it was never easy because his answer to me was be crucified. Right. Um, but out of the darkness, what is it that God is trying to give us in the darkness. It's out of the darkness that he draws forth a clear plan. And I'll read you an excerpt from the beginning of the book. It says, it's in Jesus's great love for and his trust in his father, ultimately shown in his surrender in the weakness of the cross, that we see how God never abandons those children of his who trust and fear him in love. So here you have Jesus on the cross, and he's weak, and he feels little, and it's dark, it's scary, it's confusing. And what does Jesus do? He surrenders to it. He doesn't use his divine power as the second person of the Trinity to annihilate these people. He surrenders, and what does he do? He says, Father, 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 into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, take this cup from me. Father, forgive them. Father, Father, Father. He surrenders in that littleness, and that's his strength in the cross. It's surrendering to the weakness, surrendering to the littleness, and trusting, right? It's in the darkness of the cross that the Father's plan of salvation is carried out. God had a plan to save us from hell, and it came through the cross. God could have done it any way he wanted. He, Jesus didn't have to be born like this little tiny child that's so vulnerable that people wanted to kill. He could have come from a cloud, or he could have used a miraculous power so that everyone saw who he was, but he didn't. He was so humble. God's plan was the cross. He didn't want those people to crucify him. He doesn't want sin. But he, like I said, he writes straight with crooked lines, right? So he allowed sin and Jesus conquered it through love and forgiveness, right? It's in Jesus's weak littleness on the cross offered to the Father in love that the Father carries out his great plan to conquer death and sin. It's through accepting that nothingness, that littleness, offering it to the Father and allowing him to conquer death because they're one, right? It's out from the darkness, the obscurity and the pain of the cross that we are healed, we are saved, and we are guided by Jesus's clear light of love. It's from his death that we're given life. It's just, you could meditate on that for the next 24 hours. So I started praying the other night about this idea of darkness. And the Lord really showed me, you know, God didn't want darkness at the beginning, right? Because it says in Genesis, right? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Evening came and morning followed the first day. So the first thing God does in creation is gets rid of the darkness. So why are we sitting here thinking about it, <laughs> right? Because that was perfection. He created, you know, the Garden of Eden, and he put us there without sin. But as soon as humanity sinned, they said, I don't want your light, in essence. And they, they allowed darkness to enter back in, right? And God doesn't abandon us. So eventually, Jesus had to enter that darkness to pull us back into heaven, which is eternal light. And we, as part of his body the church, right? We are called to go into that darkness with him through suffering. There's no perfect life on this side of eternity. 
but we take that on, we unite it to him. He even gives us a foretaste of heaven now. He made Kiara's burden light as she's dying, holding her son, right? He can give you little glimpses of it. But I remember a priest saying to me once, you know, not all pasta's fettuccine on this side of <laughs> eternity. You know, you got you to gotta take everything that comes. It can't just be what's your favorite, right? But he gives us little drops of light, and then he pushes us towards heaven. And that's like what we were created for. And then we see in John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things came to be through him. Without him, nothing came to be. And what came to be through him was life. And this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus didn't just like think that reality. He lived that reality on Calvary. Jesus could have come and saved us and, you know, in a totally different way. But then when you felt crucified because somebody in your family doesn't understand you, somebody in your church is persecuting you, somebody at work is doing something bad, then you'd feel alone. But Christ wanted you to know that you are never alone. And so he enters that darkness with us to say, well, you guys don't worry. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The miracle is greater because he was crucified, because he's dark. You can see I balanced it. It doesn't, if I actually was worried when Vicki was touching this because I thought I knocked it down twice. It's barely there. <laughs> but look at him in that darkness. And it's on the cross when he can't see his father, when everyone's abandoned him, he's tortured in pain, when he says to you, calling your name, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. Not like there's a lot of hope, so don't really worry, or, you know, look over here. Like, that's a promise from God. So no matter what you see in your life, it can be personal, it can be in the world, it can be politically, it can be, you know, whatever. Jesus wants you to look at him in the darkness on the cross and say, I believe the light shines in the darkness and it won't overcome it. You might take me down, right? My persecuted Christians, they get killed saying that. But... They say it. They're saintly, right? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. And what's the next scripture I have? From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. So here he is on the cross, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light was in his heart, in faith, in trust, in forgiveness, in love, in hope, and the light was in the heart of Our Lady, and she shared that together with him. But we're going to talk more about her in a, later. So that's darkness, right? God doesn't want us in darkness, but when you enter the darkness, you get to see the light of Christ who shines in the darkness. Which is why sometimes, you know, like during Lent, like we're called to meditate on that darkness of Christ, right? And his suffering, to not be afraid to let it kind of quiet everything around you so you can see new lights that you might not have seen. Stillness. Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things, but Mary has chosen the better part and it shall not be taken from her. We're all Martha in some way, right? We're all Martha. Why did Jesus say that? I see it as him preaching what I said, um, that what you do is not as important as who you are and how you love. Jesus didn't say, Martha, Martha, you should never have been doing all of this. But where's your heart, right? Mary was attentive in love to Jesus. Martha needed to do what she was doing with her heart attentive to Jesus. But where was Martha looking? At Mary, 
she's not helping me, right? (laughs) And so what does Jesus do to prove a point to all of the Marthas of the world? He says, stop. Mary's chosen the better part. In Russian, it's the best part. The best part. What is that best part? It's that, that attentive, loving stillness, the depth of your heart, that relationship that you have with God. And we see Jesus doesn't just tell us that. He lives it on the cross. What if Jesus had lived till he was 80? You know how many people he could have converted, he could have healed, like, you know, he could have traveled the whole earth himself. He could have, but he didn't. Those hands that healed were bound still. Jesus couldn't do anything. What did I write? Jesus couldn't do much on the cross because his hands and feet were crucified. But it was in this great act of still surrender and love that we were saved. The greatest act happened in stillness. What we do is not as important as how much we love, right? And silence, silence as a resting place for the Holy Spirit. There's different types of silence, right? Not all silence is good. There's silence of indifference. There's silence of fear. There's silence of cowardness, of ignoring somebody, of betraying someone. There's ways you can use silence that are not always good, right? But then there's a silence full of love, and that's the springboard for who? Jesus, who is the Word, right? His Word, it's not just something He says, He is that. And he gets dropped from heaven into our lives in places of silence, prepared in love, right? And it's interesting because he also taught us that in the Passion. What does it say in Matthew? He did not answer him one word so that the governor was greatly amazed. Jesus could have defended himself. Everything they said was false. He was like divine wisdom incarnate. What did he say? I am the way, the truth, right? He was truth incarnate. Why didn't he just speak truth and have him fall to the ground? But he was silent because he depended on his father and his father's will to defend him. And God did defend him in the resurrection, right? God always defends us, but it's sometimes not the way we want, right? We want it now and we want it visible. Look at, I always hated the example of Joan of Arc. But Jesus said to St. Joan of Arc, I will defend you, don't worry. So she was like, okay, I'm going into battle. And then they captured her and burned her at the stake. (laughs) But then she was canonized and he did defend her. And we look to her as a great model of holiness, right? So like God's, God's timing is different than ours. But God defended Jesus himself. The son of God was so humble, he depended on the father to defend him. Jesus' silence and his passion was one of love for those who sinned against him. And his silence on the cross was one of listening, expecting, waiting, hoping, and trusting his father. He loved Those people who were being so awful to him so much, he didn't say a thing. He just let the Holy Spirit work. And we don't know what happened to all of them. You know, after he rose from the dead, like what happened at night in their bed at home when they're laying awake thinking about what just happened? God totally could have saved them because of Christ's silence. It took more strength to be silent than it would have been to defend himself. So he showed the power of God. And he showed that he laid down his life, right? He says, I lay down my life freely. I have the power to lay it down and to take it up again. And one of my favorite passages in John, when Judas comes, what does it say? Jesus knowing full well what was going to happen, went forth to him and said, who are you looking for? He didn't hide. It's not like Jesus didn't know he was going to get arrested. 
Look at that self-composure. And what was the source of it? His trust within his father's love and plan. Can you imagine having that much trust every day of your life in all the situations that you meet? I mean, that is my map or my goal. So I can always grow because I'm never that perfect, <laughs> right? But like meditate on that a little bit. And so what we want to do in this retreat is to create a place of silence as a resting place for the Holy Spirit, a resting place for the word, a resting place for the Father to come and to speak to you and maybe even defend you in the areas where you're suffering or you feel like you need to be defended, right? I remember the sister I was with in Russia used to love to say that to me. Oh, Mary, all we're doing here is creating a resting place for the Holy Spirit because <laughs> everything else failed. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, sister. <laughs> but that's, you know, to create a place where the Holy Spirit can rest within you. And I want you to think about that passage from Hosea. I will lead her into the desert and I will speak to her heart. That's what he wants to do in this retreat. But I see this retreat as just like the tip of the iceberg, as preparation for your Lent this year. You can take everything that you receive on this retreat, and then you're going to spend 40 days meditating on it and see what the Lord gives you. It's going to be different than what he gives me. And it's not always easy to be silent, right? A silent heart is a martyred heart. It's a heart martyred by loving attentiveness to her beloved. When it's hard to be silent, think about that. Can you have a martyr's heart before God where you're willing to die to your own thoughts and ideas and words to have loving attentiveness to the Father, right? It doesn't mean that you don't have a better explanation on the issue than the person talking because you probably do. If you're closer to Jesus, you're probably closer to truth, right? But you love giving your attention to him even more than trying to make sure the whole world thinks like you, right? And by drawing your attention to heaven, you're giving him a resting place on earth, and then he'll come and he'll just illumine from you. Have you ever just walked in the room and had everything change it was interesting. When I was in Nigeria, I was staying with a bishop and the seminarians would come and set up um, mass every day and they do it wrong every single day. And Bishop has a, had a temper and he would get so mad at them. And one morning we came in and it's like five in the morning. And I mean, I'm feeling bad for them. And he says, if this woman was not sitting in this chapel right now, I'd kick you all out and tell you to go to the cathedral and get you out of my private chapel because you don't do anything I tell you anyway. But because Mary's here, I can't do that. <laughs> so it's a warning, <laughs> right? And all I was is like sitting there praying and being really quiet, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe, like, settle down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, it's all going to be okay. <laughs> but like just the presence of somebody else there who was praying, calm the situation. So just your silent presence in difficult situations allows God to illuminate other people. And my dad used to tell us that growing up, he'd say, he'd have family meetings. Everyone is watching you and it'll come back to you someday. You don't know when, you don't know where, but what you do is being watched and you're either affecting people positively or negatively. And it's incredible over the years how it does come back to me. Because, you know, people that like I never talked to growing up that was like, we always watched you and that was like the goal for my family now. And, but I never really knew anybody in your family. I mean, it's just kind of wild. But it's the example that like you, your presence can affect people right? Just being a landing place for the Holy Spirit. So those are the three things that we're going to really think about. It's darkness, silence, and stillness. And I want to read this little part of the last part of that chapter that this comes from because I think it's 
um, a great example to people. When you say like, why would God speak to you through darkness, stillness, and silence? Like it's so anti-American culture. But that's how he worked through scripture always, right? From the cross, Jesus uses his darkness, stillness, and silence as instruments to give the greatest light, to do the greatest act, and to speak a word that is rung in people's minds and hearts for all generations. Out of the darkness, he draws forth a clear plan. That is how God has always worked. In the night of Abraham's old barren age, he built up a great nation as countless as the stars. In the moment Isaac was to be sacrificed in obedience, he sent an angel to rescue him. In the lonely wilderness, when Jacob slept on a rock, the Lord came and spoke to him, promising him many descendants. And only after an angel wrestled with him, injuring Jacob in the hip, did Jacob receive a blessing from the Lord. Joseph was sold into slavery, yet from the pit of his jail cell, God lifted him up to be a great helper to Pharaoh and a savior to his family. After years of slavery in Egypt, God rescued his people saving Moses from the sword and calling him forth to guide the Israelites to the promised land. In the desert, God split the Red Sea to save his people. He provided water from a rock and bread from heaven. Three times in the night when he was sleeping, Samuel heard God calling him. And Jonah heard God speak to him in the belly of a whale. Silence, darkness, stillness, right? Daniel was thrown to the lions and yet not a bone of his body was harmed. And all the people praised the one true God on account of his faithfulness saving him that night. From the dark night of faith, which Joseph the husband of Mary suffered, God revealed his great plan to him in a dream. And twice he was warned at a dream, in a dream at night to go to Egypt and then return to Nazareth so that the Christ child would be safe. It's precisely in the night, in the stillness, in the silence, and I would say in the suffering of God's people from which God spoke to them and that he delivered them. Jesus from the dark night of the cross gave life to everyone. And that is how God worked in the mystery of salvation. That's how he works in each of our lives today. What I want to leave you with at the end is the next chapter of my book, which has to do with nails. And the idea that the nails that crucified Christ to the cross are not just like symbolic. Like sometimes we like think about that, right? Like, oh, think about his nails. Oh, isn't he beautiful on the cross, right? They were metal, they were sharp, they made him bleed and he was in excruciating pain. The cross was concrete. Concrete people who love Jesus loved betrayed him, abandoned him, lied about him, rejected him. Concrete nails and whips secured him to the cross. The cross is not something just spiritual in our lives. It's real. Each one of you could write down a list of what the concrete sufferings of your life either are or have been. And that is where Christ is going to meet you. That's the darkness, the stillness, the silence. Sometimes you might be like, why is he not answering me? But do you know the joy you give him laying awake at night in bed, crying and asking him why he's not answering you? Because your longing is, is so beautiful. Like he just like steps back and waits. Like sometimes I'm like, you know, I know that you love to see me so panicked about your will, but like, come on, <laughs> you, know? you know, but like it stretches your heart so that you can receive more love. 
The desert cleans away an area so that his flowers can bear fruit, right? And, and like a, a desert cactus is so much more incredible to me than, you know, a flower that, that grows in, without in the scorching sun and without any water and all of that. Then if you have, you know, like a, a, a swamp with all these like lily pads or whatever that comes from the water, right? But I mean, God, he draws you into the suffering, but it's going to be concrete. Don't fear the cross. Take it to him. And as concrete as the pain is, is as concrete as his healing will be. The lepers were ugly and smelly with skin falling off. And then they were beautiful with skin like a baby. It was concrete. And the miracle was that much greater. Think about the healing where they said, you know, was it this man who sinned or his parents that made him born blind? And Jesus said, nobody sinned. It was so that the great works of God can be shown, right? So often I feel like the Lord must be like, you know what? Let him treat Mary like that. She'll forgive him. She'll love him. And then there'll be more love on earth, <laughs> right? He picks out his favorite. One of the saints, I don't remember which one, said that like a predestined soul is always one that suffers. God only chooses his favorites to be closest to him on the cross. So when your life has suffering and has these elements, it's a blessing and it's a gift. When you enter the darkness, the stillness, and the silence, it's like going back to that beginning, that beginning darkness and stillness and silence where God said, let there be light, right? And you bring it to him on the cross and he recreates you. In Latin, it's fiat lux, let there be light. And it's beautiful because when the angel came to Our Lady and said, will you be the mother of Christ? What did she say? Fiat, right? Let it be done. God was going to recreate humanity through her yes and give light to his people, right? And it was on, you know, when Jesus taught us to pray, fiat voluntas tua, your will be done. What did Christ pray in his passion on the cross? Lord, take this, take this cup if it can be your will, but if not, let thy will be done. It's a way, the cross is a way of entering that, that recreation of us, right? It's, it's, it's part of the process. The suffering is part of the process to be recreated. It's like giving Christ a blank canvas, right? And saying, here, yes, I accept everything. Recreate me, right? Say fiat lux over my life. Let there be light, right? He wants that. And we can only do that when we imitate John the Baptist and say what? I must decrease, he must increase. When we come to Christ on the cross, it naturally humbles us, which is why people don't like it, right? Pride is very comfortable. You know, humility makes you vulnerable, you know, you don't, you just feel like you're flailing, right? But when you decrease, then he can increase and he fills that. Look at our lady. She's the perfect example of that, right? And we look at her prayer in the Magnificat. What does she say? The Lord has done, you know, mighty things for me. He's lifted up the lowly, lifted them up. So don't be afraid to become little. We're going to have a whole talk on littleness tomorrow. But don't be afraid to become little and vulnerable and weak because then God will, mag will be magnified in your life. Don't be afraid of the crosses. That's where God is going to be glorified. I promise you. And then other people will see you as bold. There's a beautiful homily I heard once on the bold humility of Our Lady. And it's true. She was very bold in her fiat, in her lowliness, right? And we see that, you know, her as the queen, but that's what God can do in a humble handmaid that gives him everything, even in the suffering, the suffering of not being understood by her people when she was pregnant, the suffering of, you know, even in the presentation, you yourself, a sword will pierce, so the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. To see the suffering of not only her son, but God firsthand for 33 years and to stand at the foot of the cross 
I mean, it's incredible. But she, she humbled herself to the plan of God that she did not understand. And all of her sufferings were united to Christ's sufferings. And then God was magnified in it. And we receive hope from that. So that's my hope for you guys on this retreat, that you can enter into darkness, silence, and stillness, into that humility of bringing your concrete crosses and sufferings to God and humbling yourself and saying, thy will be done and letting him recreate you, let him heal you, let him be magnified and glorified in you. So that's my first talk. Oops, it's exactly an hour. Praise God. <laughs> Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. That is funny.